so much for joining us today for the second in our um, 2022 webinar series focused on AIS. And today we are going to be looking at various ways research has um, been incorporating AIS data to help understand the marine environment in, um, in new ways. So our research um, today is being drawn from all three coasts. We've got uh, one looking at the Pacific, we've got in the Atlantic and also some work in the Arctic. And uh, I want to acknowledge to start with that I'm currently um, situated on the ancestral territories of the Cowichan tribes, that's on Vancouver Island. And uh, I'm very grateful for the long stewardship of the, the lands and waters of this area. And I believe we have a lot to learn from how um, Indigenous knowledge uh, understands the marine environment in a more holistic way than sometimes what Western science can, can achieve. Our first speaker today um, is uh, from, originally from, um, some of the work was done at UVic, and I'm sure she'll mention that more, but is now with the uh, Department of Fisheries and Oceans, and that's Norma Sarasogas. And, um, sorry, I'm distracted by a few more people joining. We will, we'll get everybody in. And just for those who, um, who may be uh, new to this, this webinar series, the Canadian Marine Shipping Risk Forum is a community of practice that was launched back in 2019. And it was a, an effort um, between Neopar and Clear Seas. And Neopar is the Marine Environmental Observation Prediction and Response Network. And uh, a collection of academics across Canada working together for those purposes and Clear Seas Center for Responsible Marine Shipping a nonprofit um, research institute focused on safer and more sustainable marine shipping. And we had some support from Exact Earth, which is actually now um, Spire, as they've been, they've been bought by um, a larger company, and they're providers of AIS data um, from satellites. So the community of practice, its purpose is to um, provide a, a place, uh, a gathering place for people and organizations who are working in or conducting research on shipping risk. And it allows people the opportunity to network and share knowledge and um, have, have conversations about this, this topic of marine shipping risk, as there is certainly a lot going on in this, in this space. So our agenda today, before we get into um, speakers, uh, we'll just go through some quick introductions, and then um, we'll, we'll hear from Norma and Andrea about using AIS to learn about commercial whale watching operations. Then we'll go to the Atlantic coast to hear from Leah Poulton about collaborative remediation of abandoned, lost, and discarded fishing gear in southwest Nova Scotia. We'll have a short break, and then we will hear from Mark Stoddard about example use cases of historical satellite AIS data for the analysis of maritime activity in polar waters. I've allowed some time at the end if there's a, um, additional questions beyond what um, we have time for for each of the presentations. And if there are no additional questions, then we will just wrap up a bit early. But uh, I wanted to allow that time as our first webinar had quite a lot of, of conversation and questions and want to make sure that if there are people want to ask questions of the speakers or if people want to share their own experiences using AIS data that we have a, a chance to do that. Okay, so now let's um, move into our first presentation. Um, and uh, with all of these presentations, I'll ask that you just hold your questions till the end of the presentation. We've allowed for time at the end of each presentation for questions for that speaker. And when you'd like to ask a question, feel free to raise your hand um, or you can type it into the chat if you prefer. And I will, I will monitor the chat and read out any questions that come into there. And uh, you're, you're welcome to have your video on if you'd like or off if you prefer. And uh, we will, we will um, hope to have a, an engaging conversation after, after each of these presentations. And if you have any questions or any technical difficulties, again, um, please feel free to, to use the chat or message me directly, and I will do my best to, to help you out. 
So our first speaker is uh, Norma Sarasogas, and she is joined by Andrea Nizzoli, and they will be presenting the results of a project that used AIS data to track commercial whale watching vessels in the Salish Sea and west coast of Vancouver Island. And this project was a collaborative effort between the University of Victoria and the Department of Fisheries and Oceans. So Norma is currently an aquatic biologist in the Ocean Science Division at Fisheries and Oceans Canada, and previously she was a research associate with the Coral Group at the University of Victoria. Norma completed a Master of Science in Geography at UVic, and she also has a Bachelor of Science in Biology and Marine Science from the Fairleigh Dickinson University. And I'll just share Andrea's bio as well. They're going to be sharing this presentation. Andrea graduated from the University of Victoria in 2021 with a Master of Science in Geography, and her thesis work focused on modeling marine vessels engaged in wildlife viewing behavior using AIS. And currently, Andrea is a spatial analysis for carbon modeling with the carbon accounting team at the Canadian Forest Service. She has a passion for uh, spatial data science, machine learning, and remote sensing of the environment, and is also fond of ball hockey and volleyball. I will now hand over to Norma and um, Andrea to share their presentation. Thank you. Um, I guess I would like to start first by acknowledging um, and respecting the Logan people and with tra traditional territory I live, uh, play and work, and the Sankis, Esquimal, and Wasanic uh, peoples whose historical relationships with the land continue to this day. I'm going to share my screen, but I'm also going to share on the chat in the chat a link to the story map. So I'm going to be using the story map to um, walk you through the work that Andrea and I did in the last uh, four years now. Yes. So first, let's share the screen, and hopefully you can see it uh, now. So. I'm, um, you're welcome to, um, you should see the link now and click on it and take a look at the story map. Um, you can welcome to follow on your own or, or just look at the screen and as I walk you through uh, its content. Um, depending on your internet connection, some of the maps might take a, a few minutes to load, a minute or two. Uh, so maybe it's just best if you follow along. Um, the, I, my scheme, quickly through some of its content uh, because I created this with the idea of being viewed in independently without the need of, of having someone presenting. Um, so there, some of it is quite detailed, so I'm, I'm just not going to go in, in a lot of that um, with it. And uh, the story map is going to remain uh, available and open uh, until the end of July this year. Afterwards, uh, I have to close it down, um, but I'm working on an uh, alternative arrangement so I can make, uh, we can make the content um, more permanent or, or at least for a few more months anyway. So with that, um, I want to introduce you to, to the talk today, what watching operations in Canada specific region where we use AIS data to gain insights into commercial whale watching operations in the Sea and the west coast of Vancouver Island. So the aim of the story map was to facilitate communication and exploration of the results. Um, and this work is part of the WAVE project. Uh, you have a link here, maybe you wanna take a look at it, which was um, carried at University of Victoria and was funded by Neopar and Exactor, which now it's Spire. <clears throat> so commercial world watching operations uh, started in the 1980s in, in a company based in the north coast of Vancouver Island, uh, but it has grown quite a bit since then with now an estimated uh, 49 world watching companies that operate in the Sailor Sea, west coast of Vancouver Island and north coast of Vancouver Island. And there is one company up in Prince Rupert as well. Uh, but this story map is going to focus most and in two regions specifically. One is the Sailor Sea uh, here in blue, and then uh, sort of the southern part of the Sailor Sea and uh, the west coast of Vancouver Island. So the well watching industry um, has seen a number of uh, changes in terms of management measures, both uh, guidelines as guidelines and, and also as uh, mandatory. Um, regulations. And we put together this slide <clears throat> where it, it shows you sort of the, the timeline of where uh, these this, uh, measures were introduced and by who, who was just Canadian or US 
or by the uh, Pacific Whale Watching Association, which is uh, has um, subscribers from both uh, Canadian and, and uh, US companies. Uh, these measures, most of them apply both to commercial and recreational uh, vessels that carry uh, whale watching activities. I'm not gonna spend a lot of time talking about AIS, uh, but uh, because the bigger most of you know about what AIS is, but I'm gonna spend a bit more time describing the different type of AIS transponders and uh, AIS data providers. So there are three main classes of, of AIS transponders, and these are uh, equipment that the vessels carry on board and that uh, send signals about the positions and vessel, other vessel information. And some of them can also receive uh, AIS signals from nearby vessels and plot it on their plots. Um, there's class A, class B, and class B plus. The main difference is the in their um, transmitting power. So the class A is the most powerful um, uh, device uh, where uh, it's required on most commercial vessels by SOLAS, under SOLAS. And um, so these are large vessels and they can transmit positions uh, to uh, between two to 10 seconds. Uh, but this of course varies depending on the speed of the vessel. The class B are the units often carry by uh, recreational vessels or small vessels, vessels that are not required to carry AIS. The transmission power is much lower, which means that uh, they need to be closer to a, a receiver in order to, to, re to receive that signal. Also the positions are transmitted um, at, a, at a sort of higher, uh, lower resolution, uh, temporal resolutions between 30 to 180 seconds. And then we have the uh, class B plus, which now is they're they're becoming a lot more popular. They're a bit more expensive than the class B, the class A. They're the most expensive uh, units, and um, they have higher transmission power <clears throat> and also transmit positions uh, more more frequently. Another main difference between this the uh, the transponders is the uh, like the transmission. Um, system. So there's the, the stoma and this coma, which is hard to say with all the uh, letters there, but, but mainly it's just the, the way the messages are transmitted and, the, and what type of messages they, they support. So um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stop here. There's more, uh, there's another slide where I'm going to be talking more about, particularly the class B, class B plus. And what we're focusing about these two units in particular is because these are the main units that the uh, commercial world watching operations uh, will use. Some vessels have class A, but mostly, most of them, particularly the ones based in uh, Canada, will carry a class B or a class B plus. Um, and the well watching um, industry now is required to carry uh, class uh, B or class A transponders since 2019, although um, we noticed that really they started um, implementing this, this, uh, this change uh, in 20 and 2021. So in 2019, there's still a few vessels that several vessels that were not equipped with AIS in Canada, in the US. Uh, now they all require to have um, AIS, but we noticed that it, it was um, AIS responders were, were more present uh, earlier on, uh, and also because they, they're larger vessels as well. AIS data providers. So uh, we learn a lot through this project about the type of data that you can access and its characteristics, its pros and cons. So we started with Exact Earth because it was part of the project and they were able, uh, part of the deal um, was to access, uh, have access of, of data for free um, for the areas that we were interested in. So we thought, right, uh, you know, we, we don't need to look for more data, but we soon realized that the, particularly the resolution of the data, the temporal resolutions, the, 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 um, this, the number of data points uh, that we were obtaining from exactors for the vessels that we were interested in looking at was very poor. Like we, we had messages every three minutes or more, depending on the area. 
and, and we soon realized that that was not going to work for us because we the type of work we wanted to do we wanted the highest resolution of data as possible possible so then we thought uh we were looking into um and we learned about as hub so as hub it's a it's an uh, AIS data sharing center that provides access to free real-time raw AIS data, and AIS data to AIS hub members. So what we did, and we have to learn to do that, and, and, and Andrew was instrumental in this, we, uh, we figured out how to um, set up an AIS receiver on the roof of our building at University of Victoria. And in order to then feed uh, data. So we had a receiver, we were able to feed data to AS Hub, and in return, we were getting data from the network of receivers in, in the area. And that worked, and it worked really well. The only thing that we noticed then is that there's only a handful of receivers in, um, in this area and in the Sea and the west coast of Vancouver Island. Not enough to really capture what we wanted to capture spatially within the area. Um, you can go to the website. I added the links here, and you can. There is a map of uh, of where the receivers are from AIS Hub. So then it's like, okay, we need uh, the, the really only option we had left was Coast Guard, um, getting access to the Coast Guard uh, AIS data, and that took quite a bit of effort, uh, but we managed to get it uh, through the uh, Ocean Nexus Canada. They have an agreement with Coast Guard. So we, um, we signed an agreement with uh, ONC and in return, the, uh, and, and we, we um, did a data request uh, explaining the extent and the temporal, um, uh, the data that we needed. And um, after a few, it was also new for them to, I must say, to ONC. So it was kind of a learning process for both of us, for both our groups. And, but finally we did get data uh, four years worth of data uh, for the regions that I just described previously and for all vessels. But then we just were, again, interested in the commercial while watching uh, vessels. So we have a list of MMSIs and, and that's what we sort of um, looked. So um, I'm gonna meet this person. <laughs> um, right, so I'm just gonna go in a bit more in depth before I, I carry on with the um, class B and class B plus. So we had a, an opportunity that, to explore this in a bit more depth uh, with um, a particular vessel that we equipped with, um, I'll just back up for a second. A part of the project too was we had this AIS transponders provided by exactors that we were giving to uh, well watching companies to, to put on their, on their vessels. So we had a handful of companies that agreed to participate in the project. And one of the vessels is based uh, in Yukulet and initially it was equipped with a class B um, transponder in August, 2018. And, and then we, we actually gained access to a class uh, B plus um, transponder. So we equipped that vessel with switch, equipped the vessel with, with a B plus in August, 2021. I think it was 2020. But anyway, the data shows 2021 here. And the main thing that I just want to highlight with these graphs is that um, the, the class B, its, it's reception it was pretty good uh, in terms of um, the terrestrial network. Um, so data from Coast Guard was able to capture um, positions from sand transmitted by, by this vessel. Um, but you can barely see uh, the, the number of messages received by the satellite network. Um, but once we switch to the B+, plus, that really changes. Still, we get more positions with the, tra with the terrestrial network, but uh, the satellite, it, it really improved that, that, uh, that reception with the B+. Plus. And the main reason for this is, well, two main reasons. One is that the trans transmission power is higher, but also these units, um, you can turn on uh, the transmission of uh, message 27. And my understanding is that these messages are transmitted on a different channel than other AIS messages. 
and are less affected by noise from other radio frequencies. So this is something we discovered with the satellite um, AIS data is that it's, it's masked, their, their messages are masked, but uh, in Canada in particular is an issue by the radio frequency in, in, in I think it's, it has to do with the net, uh, weather network or weather radio messaging. Um, so it's, it's really hard for the satellite to, to listen to those messages. But the B plus that, and because of that message in the seven, that is, is changing things. So I'm gonna move on um, with that. So here, it's just looking at the, the data that we, so the, the vessels that we were looking at and analyzing. Um, so for the South Coast, the, uh, the kind of light blue shows the number of uh, well watching vessels that were equipped with AIS. And, and you see the numbers have slowly increased uh, from 2019 to 2021, mostly because vessels and companies had the time to acquire the units if they didn't have one already or was not provided by us and, and install them. Also, you know, it came the COVID pa uh, pandemic and that it's, you know, it's a theme that, that keeps showing up in, in our data. It made a difference in terms of operations and, and the number of data and vessels in the water. But nevertheless, uh, another thing I wanted to point out is that a particular in 2019, uh, that only, only a fraction of the uh, well watching fleet was equipped with, with uh, AIS. More than, um, I will say, you know, more than half of the fleet it still was not equipped with and operating, actively uh, operating in the Celis in the south coast of the Celis Sea were not equipped with, with AIS. So this is significant when you when we go and, and interpret uh, some of the data that I will show um, later. In the west coast of Vancouver Island, we don't have numbers of the vessels not equipped with AIS uh, for each of these years, <clears throat> but we have numbers of the number of vessels that had AIS and how that changed. Um, again, some vessels just didn't operate, um, stay you know, in dry dock or, or whatever um, once the, the pandemic hit and then there was flight recovery in 2021. Um, so we're getting into the data analysis. So as I said before, we chose um, the Canadian Coast Guard terrestrial AIS data as our main data, um, AIS data to analyze. And here I'm just gonna talk about two main sort of outputs um, from the data set. One is the, a well watching trip and then um, a potential wildlife viewing event. So a well watching trip is a trip derived from AIS positions with a start and end point at the home port. And um, we, we limit, um, we define those, those well watching trips if it lasted at least two hours, uh, but no more than five and a half hours. And they need to have at least one potential wildlife viewing events. Some of the trips, there were not well watching trips. Some of the trips where a vessel based in Victoria needed to go repair their vessel, do some maintenance in, out in, in Sydney, for example. So we have those trips, but those were not, we had those positions, but those were not well watching trips. So we, they were removed from the data set. A potential wildlife viewing event is a set of AIS points, which um, from a known well, commercial well watching vessels that are likely engaged in a wildlife viewing or, or searching for wildlife. Uh, we limit those events to between 10 to 60 minutes long, um, so an hour and at a maximum speed of 12 knots. So they could be just stationary, so zero knots to, to a maximum of 12 knots. And we remove any points that uh, from the wildlife, but wildlife viewing events that were within like narrow passages or harbors where uh, most likely they were going slow because they were exiting a harbor or it was narrow passage, so they have to navigate slowly. So just to avoid some false positives, um, would remove those data points from the, from the data set as well. So I'm gonna switch now to Andrea, who she's gonna talk about how, and this is really her, the work of her thesis, how she identified those wildlife viewing events. Thanks, Norma. So uh, 
For a couple of years, I was working on different classification models and conducted an evaluation on the accuracy and utility of these models for detecting commercial whale watching vessels and their behavior or when they may or may not be engaged in a wildlife viewing event. And I found uh, three classification models of different types that would um, give us a variety of possible variables to look at, as well as different methods to see which was best for its utility in detecting wildlife viewing events. Um, so those three different models are all machine learning models, which are automatic learning patterns within the data, either from a statistical or non-statistical method, um, and can be used to make decisions under uncertainty or without prior knowledge. So the three models used uh, a subset of whale watching trips from one single vessel out of the Victoria Harbor collected by Molly Fraser in 2019. Um, and there's only 20 whale watching trips used. I comp uh, compared density-based spatial clustering application with NOISE, or I might say DEBSCAN for short, going forward, which is a non-parametric uh, modeling that looks at the density of uh, geographic locations of points. Uh, that was the variable that we use, but it could be used with multiple variables in a multi-dimensional fashion, um, which might be worth looking at in the future. But we did end up choosing the hidden Markov model, which is a state-based stochastic model that represents the probability distribution for a sequence of AIS points. And in particular, the hidden Markov model takes into, consider, in, into consideration the point previous to the current point that we're looking at. So if we're trying to classify point with the letter A, we're going to uh, look at you know, A minus uh, to see what the state of that point was prior to. Um, logistic regression is a discriminative classification algorithm that is used for binary classification, so just wildlife viewing versus non-viewing. Um, but it was also valuable because it provides a level of influence called a uh, logistic regression coefficient of the variables on the models. So it gave us an understanding on how time, speed over ground, course over ground, geographic location, turning angle, and distance might impact uh, these detections of wildlife viewing events. So if you can go down, Norma, please. Thank you. Um, to select the model, we looked at different statistical measures that would represent model performance. Overall accuracy isn't always the best measure. So the F score is a harmonic mean of precision and recall. So it essentially tells us uh, how likely there are true positives and true negatives, you know, false positives, false negatives, uh, the classification, how likely it was to be accurate. Uh, we also looked at uh, the log logistic regression coefficients, which supported the use of the speed over ground for the hidden Markov model state-based approach. So once we decided to use the hidden Markov model based on the accuracy measures, um, we were able to confirm the use of speed over ground. And if you go to the next phase, please, this next slide, I suppose. Um, the next phase of the research compared a supervised method versus an unsupervised method. So machine learning supervised methods, you require prior knowledge and you use that knowledge to train or have the machine learning algorithm learn the pattern of the data. Unsupervised is when the model, the classification model learns the pattern of the data itself. So the two graphs in this picture show how the supervised method is, is kind of uh, very accurate, um, accurately fitting the curves of the speed over ground distributions. And there's two distinct curves for viewing and non-viewing. Unsupervised isn't quite as close, but the benefits from that is that you don't need any prior knowledge. And we were trying to reduce the reliance on observed whale watching behavior data because it doesn't exist for a large geographic region. And we also needed data that was very specific. So Molly Fraser's data sold us down to the minute exactly when the vessel was watching or not watching an animal. And we don't have that information for the entire fleet. So it would be very difficult to collect. And so we wanted to make sure that an unsupervised uh, approach would be able to be sufficiently accurate when compared to the supervised approach, and then take into account the facts that we don't have all of that information. We don't have that prior knowledge that was required. 
if you scroll down a bit more, Norma, it just goes into how we did do the same statistical tests and that it did prove that the unsupervised method was sufficient while we're still reducing the reliance on that data. Um, and there's a bit more, uh, my thesis is linked here if you want to get into the nitty gritty, but I'm gonna try not to get too technical here. Thanks, Norma. Excellent, thank you, Andrea. Um, so yeah, we're getting now into showing you some results. So uh, these maps uh, show the density of well watching trips, the number of vessels for sale, uh, com uh, commercial well watching vessels from 2019, 2020, and 2021. Uh, so we can see, for example, for example, clearly how uh, the reduction of number of trips between 2019 and 2020 because of COVID. Also, although the extent of it, um, if we're just looking at how far the vessels were going, it didn't really change that much. It's just the number of vessels or trips uh, got reduced. And then we see a, a, an increase, a uh, slight increase from 2020 to 2021. And I expect that now in 2022, numbers are gonna be back up to 2019 levels or higher. Uh, but again, uh, I'm pointing out, for example, that 2020, 2019 only represents a fraction um, of the actual well watching activity in the area, because uh, as I mentioned before, only a, a portion of the well watching fleet was equipped with AIS and particularly uh, vessels operating in, uh, in Canada. Um, this map now shows the uh, number of wildlife viewing events per, per year. And again, we see, uh, because it really comes from the same data, uh, a reduction in the number of wildlife viewing events in 2020 um, and, and 2021, maybe a slightly increase, but it's hard to tell with these figures. Also, it's interesting to see uh, that there are some hotspots, areas where the number of wildlife viewing events, of potential wildlife viewing events, is um, they're high uh, compared to others. So those uh, darker uh, orangey red colors, and how some of those hotspots sort of stay uh, in time, uh, maybe reduced but still um, visible. And I'm just going to walk you some uh, a few applications that I thought. Uh, that, that this data could be used for. So for example, one is uh, monitoring compliance. So in uh, 2019, so for example, we can, we can use um, AIS data, commercial world watching data for monitoring the compliance of regulations that particularly affect well, commercial world watching vessels and other vessels in this case, but um, you know, it tells you where the vessels are and then you can look at uh, temporarily how that compliance um, change if there are areas where they're not allowed to go. So for example, in this case, we have uh, Saturnus Island interim sanctuary zones. So the interim sanctuary zones were introduced uh, by Transport Canada, uh, believe I'm not mistaken, in 2019 and, and after that every year. Uh, and so we can use these, uh, these data to look at where commercial world watching vessels complying with with the these zones where not vessels of either any kind really, although there's some exceptions, are allowed to, to enter. So if we can use this slider, you can see that uh, the map on the left shows uh, 2019 and the map on the right, 2021. And so you can see that the reduction in the number of vessels in that area. Um, another application, uh, for example, is looking at the, the level of pressures uh, from tourism industry, in this case, uh, again, uh, commercial well watching vessels in insensitive or protected areas. So one of those hot spots that we were able to see in the wildlife viewing events comes from, uh, it's, it's linked to the uh, Race Rocks Ecological Reserve. So that area, it's rich in biodiversity and and the number of species, there is the sea lions and the rocks um, and seals, and there is also elephant seals and the water surrounding uh, raised rocks is also rich. Uh, you can cite uh, um, humpback whales and killer whales. So it's a very popular destination for commercial world watching vessels based out of Victoria, 
but also uh, based out of uh, operating or, or US vessels. Um, so with this, we can see that um, in 2019, we detected up to a thousand visits that year. Um, there's again a reduction in 2021 and in 2020 with around 700 visits, um, but still is the area most visited by commercial whale watching vessels in the Sea. Um, so again, you can just explore and then you can look at all the areas as well this way. And another one I thought and it is just, um, it's kind of interesting. You can't just rely on AIS data to, to, to get at this, but we, um, we ran a, a series of interviews with commercial whale watching operators with the results of this study um, because we, it, it, as a way to validate the, the results. And it was very pleasant surprise to, to realize that, yeah, our results sort of match their, their knowledge of being in the water and that some of the hotspots that we were seeing with uh, the uh, wildlife viewing events um, are true, true hotspots in the sense that they, they, they visit those areas because there's some wildlife uh, present to go and see. So I thought of we can explore some of these hotspots. Um, so for example, and this is from 2019. So that, that area here just south of, um, San Juan Island, that's, uh, that's an area that they um, they go visit for minke whales. Um, these are uh, an area um, often visited by, um, where they can do some whale, uh, humpback whale sightings. Um, these areas for gray whales, um, this one on, um, what's this island again? Uh, Whoopi Island, yeah. Uh, this area, it did show up in 2019, but it didn't show up in other years, 2020 or 2021. So that was interesting. I don't know why exactly, but uh, when I ask, yeah, that's that was gray whales in that area. And in this one, just um, it says upside Everett, it shows every year uh, for gray whales. And then we have some um, rockeries with sea lions and there's probably a few more that I didn't mark with the pins, but those are areas that uh, almost guarantee of some kind of wildlife sighting uh, if, when they go, because they don't tend to go very far. Um, I mean, the sea lions. And, and so just as a, to summarize, these are just a, a few points that I wanted to highlight. Uh, the first one is that I think it's very important to have a good understanding and, and really D depends on what you want to do with AIS data, but you want to have a good understanding of the different transponders used by the vessels that you're investigating. Um, and then the data that you have access to, is it satellite, is it terrestrial? Uh, if you have both, maybe you want to integrate them um, because it will really affect uh, the, the, the analysis and, and the results that you're getting from the AIS data. Um, the AIS data is it's, it's huge, uh, especially when you're looking at multi-year type analysis. So uh, having tools like machine, machine learning and, and data mining are fundamental, um, especially if you want to maximize the potential of, of the AIS data. And the its applications are numerous. I mean, I just uh, pointed up three, uh, but we can do a lot more with it. Uh, and it can inform our spatial planning. Uh, we can look at flitch, uh, flitch fleet management, so at the, uh, from the operator's points of view, they, they saw AIS as a tool to manage their fleet and, and, and sort of uh, coordinate when a vessel is out, when is another out, and, and to maybe even reduce the, um, the, the, you know, the presence of these vessels at particular times in certain areas. Um, so that was a, kind of a, an interesting point talking to the commercial world watching operators, is how they can use real-time AIS data to, to better manage their, their activities. And with that, I just want to acknowledge a lot of people and, and here are the icons for the participating whale watching operators, uh, our funders, uh, seven, and a few people were involved in the project and I just added the link or our email addresses if you want to contact us. And um, yeah, with that, I'm done. I don't know where I'm here with time, but maybe having 
hopefully not. Thank you so much, much, Norma. That was really, really interesting. And I love the, the story map approach. I think we have a couple of questions um, on deck. So we'll, we'll go to those quickly. And then uh, as we're a little bit over time, we'll, we'll be moving on to, to uh, our next presentation. But our first question is from Lovell Pratt. And she's wondering, are Washington State commercial whale watch vessels included in this study? Yes, they are. All right, and um, thank you for that. And then Ron, I'm seeing your hand, go ahead. Yeah, thanks, uh, Norman Andrew. That was very well done. A couple of short questions. Why does your story map end after July? Mm. Is it a UVic arrangement thing? Like yeah. I'm wondering if we have the same problem at Dalhousie. Yeah, no, it is. And I beg to keep, I was ending in May. Um, and I was like, please, can I have it for two more years, two more months? And yeah, but I'm working, I'm gonna see if I can, um, the plan is to build, maybe not the same style of story, story map, but similar we, within DFO, but they have the, the level of, of, yeah, logistics and I mean, around that, um, I think it's gonna be tricky, but I'm gonna find out. Uh, alternatively, um, Andrea, for example, has a, has a personal license, so we might uh, move it to her account, we'll, we'll figure out something. But yes, that's the limited is UVic uh, ge geography department. Just depends who works where and what license. Okay, thanks. Mm -hmm. uh, did you compare accessing marine traffic versus AIS hub in terms of setting up a receiver? And yeah, we did. Uh, we did explore that. The only problem with marine traffic is like yes, they take our data, but they were not giving it back for free. Oh, I thought they were. Okay. I never no, did it myself. Okay. No. And um, it was great for a while. We were bidding both, but at some point we have an issue where it stopped working with marine traffic. So we just stay with as hub because marine traffic, a lot of more users know how to use marine traffic and it just adds to the coverage. Um, but it just stopped working and we couldn't figure out how to fix it. And then at the end, we didn't think we did it. So. Okay, and one last question, you may not be the right person to ask, but since B plus is much stronger than B, AIS class B, do you think class Bs are just going to be obsolete and disappear, or do you think both types will continue? I, that's a good question, but I will say, um, I, I think people are still learning about B plus, especially, you know, maybe recreational boaters. They're a B, I think they're about $200, $300 more expensive than the B, so that's another issue. Um, but they're just making like they're so much better uh, than B. Um, okay. at, least, at least depending again, but yeah, so. Thanks very much. And we have one, one more question. This will be our, our last question. Unfortunately, we have to move on, but uh, JD Leahy from Washington Ecology has asked, um, how did you identify that a vessel was a whale watching vessel or some other kind of vessel? We had a list, we had a list of MMSIs for the commercial whale watching fleet, both from the, uh, uh, the Washington operating, based in Washington and based in Canada. Uh, the list was provided by the Pacific Whale Watching Association. Uh, the ones in the West Coast, uh, it was it's a smaller fleet, well, smaller group. And we were able just to go and, and look at using marine traffic, looking by name. So we did several things, but uh, we verified that the vessels that we were looking for, that we were including in our analysis were commercial world watching vessels. Maybe we miss one or two, um, but we really try to make sure we didn't miss any. Thank you so much, Norma and Andrea. That was really interesting. Love the story map approach. And uh, as Norma's put that in the chat, if anybody wants to explore more and play with those, those fun maps, you can, you can do that. And hopefully we'll have a little bit of time at the end for more questions, if there are any more for Andrea and Norma. But now we're going to move over to, uh, to Leah's presentation. So Leah is going to be sharing with us the collaborative remediation of abandoned, lost and discarded fishing gear in Southwest Nova Scotia. And um, I will, I'll let her get into what her project is about, but Leah has a bachelor in community design and an honors in urban design and planning and a certificate in geographic information systems from Dalhousie University. And she most recently completed her master of marine management at Dalhousie. And she's currently working towards a certification to become a registered professional planner under the Canadian Institute of Planners. 
and she's interested in the fields of marine spatial planning, landscape connectivity, and seafloor mapping. So Leah, please uh, take it away. Thank you so much for the introduction. Um, so good afternoon, everyone. Good morning, wherever you are. Uh, my name is Leah Fulton, just as mentioned, and I'm excited to um, you know, be here to today to talk about the collaborative remediation of abandoned, lost, or otherwise discarded fishing gear in Southwest Nova Scotia, um, where I will specifically be touching on the use of AIS data uh, for gear detection and um, derelict uh, gear retrieval. Um, so before I begin, I'd just like to acknowledge that this work was completed on Mi'kma'ki, the ancestral and unceded territory of the Mi'kmaq people, and we acknowledge them as the past, present, and future caretakers of this land. Um, and we are all treaty people. So I'm just going to close my camera for this presentation and uh, just to ensure there's no issues with bandwidth, um, but I'm still here. So as part of my master's research project at Dalhousie, I worked closely with Coastal Action, an environmental nonprofit organization based in Mahone Bay, Nova Scotia. Uh, working on the collaborative remediation of abandoned loss and otherwise discarded fishing gear in South Coast Nova Scotia. So this project uh, partners with industry, academia, and government uh, to prevent, reduce, and assess impacts of abandoned, lost, or otherwise discarded fishing gear on the South Shore of Nova Scotia, specifically in lobster fishing areas 33, 34, and 35 on the Nova Scotia side. Um, and this work was done over a two year uh, project period, um, commencing in July, 2020 uh, to March, 2022. So abandoned, lost or otherwise discarded fishing gear, ALBFG is considered fishing related debris that is either accidentally or deliberately disposed of into the marine environment uh, with the ability to cause significant environmental um, and economic impacts. It is considered that one fifth of all marine debris is estimated to be generated from marine based sources. There are many different ways that fishing gear can end up in the ocean. Um, first, it can be accidental. And fishers not, are not always at fault as the marine environment is shared with other industries. Often, fishers do not want to lose their gear because it represents less catch revenue lost expenses towards gear and lost time managing gear loss. Ghost gear can be generated with conflicts, uh, by conflicts with other industries like shipping, aquaculture, and just general fishing congestion. These encounters can sever buoy lines by other vessels or snarl onto active fishing gear, ultimately compromising the economic efforts in fisheries. Storms and unfavorable environmental conditions can further contribute to lost gear totals. And without robust recycling programs in place, in a, inappropriate disposal at sea and poor gear conditions um, can generate more ghost gear as a result. So ghost gear has different negative environmental, social, and economic impacts, which makes this a really important issue to solve. For target species such as lobster, lobs, lost traps can indiscriminately capture bycatch for long periods after the trap is lost due to the ghost fishing cycle. And a baseline assessment research from this project resulted in an estimated commercial loss of target species upwards to $172,000 Canadian annually. In terms of environmental impacts, this ghost fishing cycle can also trap species that aren't targeted as part of the fishery, like some species at risk or entangle marine mammals, resulting in extensive injuries, deter their ability to reproduce and feed, starvation, and possible death. Also, dynamic ocean conditions um, and lost gear can damage uh, benthic ecosystems that are essentially developed, um, that are hosted on the bottom of the ocean. Um, and also lead to provide unsuitable habitats um, from ghost gear being kind of uh, stuck in the bottom of the seafloor. So for those who don't know, Southwest Nova Scotia is considered the most productive American lobster fishery um, in Canada. 
The commercial American lobster fishing industry is one of the most essential industries in Nova Scotia um, and contributes to over $500 million each year. A little research has been done um, to understand the negative effects of ALDFG on commercial fishing markets, target species, and their marine environments. But from the available published research and available and local evidence, ghost gear is clearly a serious problem. So we, when we look at the historical fishing activity data within the region of Southwest Nova Scotia, Clark's Harbor revealed to be the highest number of traps per kilometer squared at 13,771 traps per kilometer squared. Um, given that this research was done in 2014, um, this has since expected to increase uh, due to the higher demand within the industry. So how do we start by identifying areas for ghost gear retrieval? Well, in order to identify retrieval areas, there are several uh, techniques that were deployed. In 2020, three focus group sessions were held with the Brazil Rock Lobster um, 3334 Association and with the Cold Water Lobster Association. These commercial fishers that attended focus groups identified areas of frequent gear loss uh, based on known fishing grounds, um, while also referring to their own AS data. Um, as well as uh, things like environmental conditions, conflicts, and known historical areas of gear loss, um, which uh, helped us kind of understand where retrieval captains um, would prefer to uh, retrieve and, and conduct retrieval missions. In addition to uh, selection of these areas, we also use reported lost fishing gear. So as part of the conditions of ground fish and shrimp fishing license in Canada, lost fishing gear is required to be reported um, to the Department of Fisheries Oceans Canada since 2020. License holders are to report any gear within this 24 hour period um, to contribute to the database of lost gear. The data used for this analysis uh, within um, the, you know, the entire coastal action project uh, represents fishing gear up until like June 2021. So I won't be able to go into the details too much um, about a what AIS is, but I will go into the details about how it's used in retrieval missions. So within kind of um, retrieval missions, there's two distinct parts um, that we kind of used in, in this project, gear detection and gear retrieval. So AIS data was um, used in conjunction with side scan sonar data and GPS um, positioning um, so acquisition um, software for gear detection. Um, while gear retrieval, we used Fisher's Intel to determine uh, search areas. We used AIS data to understand kind of towing patterns um, as well as AIS data from the retrieval operations to provide insight into future retrieval missions. So due to the privacy um, of this kind of work and, and just kind of our confidentiality agreement, I won't be able to show AIS data from the gear retrieval operations. So in order to retrieve ghost gear, it's important to know where to look. Gear detection can essentially be introduced as a method to predetermine locations of ghost gear in order to facilitate and um, speed up the retrieval process. In 2017, the Global Ghost Gear Initiative highlighted side scan sonar as a primary tool for gear detection. Um, and side scan sonar systems essentially record a, a swath of sea floor to produce an image pertaining to the superficial seabed uh, characteristics um, through acoustic data. These instruments can be mounted on a tethered towfish and towed behind the vessel or mounted on a remotely operated vehicle. So for my um, master's project uh, in, in part of this whole work, um, my project looked at evaluating the effectiveness of this technology as a gear detection tool for large scale retrieval missions and understand the feasibility of this work for future applications. Um, because of these in international in initiatives um, promoting you know, the use of side scan sonar, there wasn't actually a whole lot of lit published literature available perta pertaining uh, to the detection of uh, ghost gear and how this affects the subsequent success of retrieval operations. So essentially this was uh, looked into further uh, within the geographic context of uh, Clark's Harbor um, in June, 2021. 
So I won't get too much into the nitty gritty of the project, it's, uh, the, the research itself, but here's a quick screenshot of some of the tracks completed showing the GPS tracks around um, Cape Sable Island um, within the Clark Harbor uh, region. So based on a combination of environmental parameters, reported last year coordinates, Fisher's knowledge and EIS data, a nine day side scan sonar survey was completed in June, 2021 where 17 transects of high quality C4 imagery was obtained. The preliminary identification of contacts, so of ghost gear contacts uh, prior to post-processing uh, revealed 161 targets identified. Um, these targets were provisionally identified as lobster traps and under other unidentified marine debris. So upon a second comprehensive review of the side scan, uh, following post-processing of the data, uh, we concluded that there was 114 potential targets, revealing that many of these initial targets were unlikely to be ghost gear. Within this area alone, there was 2,000 or just over 2,000 kilograms of gear removed from the benthic environment during the 15 days allocated. Um, there was 91 kilometers squared of uh, high quality seafloor imagery collected from the seafloor and 55 items were retrieved from the benthic environment. Um, however, only one of those items was confirmed retrieved from the identified contacts um, from the side scan sonar imagery, revealing that much of the gear that was retrieved outside of the side scan sonar transects. So here is an image of a lobster trap that is shown on the bottom of the sea floor circled in, in the white, just to kind of give you an idea of the kind of image that we're, imagery that we were looking at uh, within this part of the project. So during um, the retrieval um, operations that occurred in year one, which would be 2020 and year two, which is 2021, uh, 10 vessels towed grapples for roughly uh, for nearly 4,000 kilometers, um, searching the floor for ghost gear. So this trail map was created using the latitude and longitude co coordinates of essentially each um, uh, location from when the um, grapple was submerged into the water to when the grapple was removed and the towing stopped. Um, this essentially allowed us to calculate our uh, distance search. And this method was used uh, in place of the absence of AIS data in case if an area were to occur, um, and essentially was also used in reference to the AIS data that we did were that we were able to um, obtain. One limitation of this retrieval tow data is that not not all the tracks from the vessels are linear, and in some cases the start and end tow coordinates did not necessarily reflect the actual length. Code. So this is when we refer to the AIS data. The retrieval tow distances were based on coordinates of, like I said, when the, the grapple was submerged into the water. Um, and as you can see, there are uh, different types of um, kind of towing patterns within uh, each of the areas. So in um, kind of the Tiverton region in um, the figure A, um, we can see a more linear um, kind of uh, focus in terms of search area, whereas in comparison to figure C, uh, there's a lot more zigzag uh, movement um, and smaller toe lengths um, in comparison. So a total of 2,000, or sorry, not 2,000, 24,630 kilograms of ALDFG was retrieved from the ocean surrounding Southwest Nova Scotia. Um, and over 4,500 kilograms from seven shoreline retrievals, totaling a near 29,298 kilograms of ALDFG removed from this region. So of the debris that was removed, 68% were lobster traps and 12% was drag rope cable by weight. Um, some other really interesting highlights of this project um, were that over 25 different species were released from ghost gear uh, that was retrieved. 
um, including 652 lobsters and 57 fishes, of which were 42 were species at risk. From the data that we collected and the knowledge on trap loss within the region, an economic impact assessment was done, and it was estimated that a trap loss of 2% can create a 71,305 to 155,000 uh, commercial loss annually from decreased catches within uh, LFAs 33, 34, and 35. So there are some challenges associated to using AIS data um, in this kind of work. Um, the first being AIS software compatibility and that not all fishers use the same AIS software and some fishers required hands-on data offloads, um, which um, essentially can slow down the process of um, putting AIS data onto um, our own computers, um, visualizing it spatially, and informing retrieval missions. Um, and in some cases, there was some issues with offloading that data. So this is why we use the tow method in case if there were any issues. Another um, kind of leading into that is data transfers and sharing. So because of a lack of uh, direct data translation to retrieval vessel AIS devices, this did create some difficulties in uploading locations of lost gear um, for those targeted retrieval um, missions. Um, given the restricted use of technologies and a, perhaps a lack of comprehension for data sharing, retrieval captains were um, unfamiliar with uh, downloading uh, different sharing browsers and, and whatnot. So it was hard to work remotely in that kind of sense. And without those exact format data transfers, it's uncertain whether those data transfers were even useful in large scale retrieval missions. Um, sometimes uh, fishers were reluctant to share AIS data as searching may have occurred in areas where there were target species present, um, ultimately contributing uh, or kind of, um, you know, kind of hiding or um, not necessarily wanting to share for competitive purposes. And using the spatial data in addition to Fisher's intel was quite impactful. Um, but had this done been had this been done in a covert free time, um, we would have certainly loved to combine uh, both uh, spatial data from um, AIS um, and our tow missions, as well as Fisher's intel uh, within a mapping exercise uh, to essentially understand and um, you know better um, navigate retrieval missions moving forward um, in Southwest Nova Scotia. So I've included some images here to highlight the extent of the efforts from this project. Um, as you can see, there's really everything from, from lobster traps to certain habitats growing on um, kind of bio, bio fowl on uh, different um, fishing uh, um, uh, types. So whether that be rope, or lobster traps, um, as well as even um, pulling out some aquaculture netting, as you can see in the bottom image there. Um, and then the, yeah. Um, so if you are interested in learning more, I do encourage you to check out the Tale of Lost Fishing Gear. Um, this is a story map that was created about this project, um, and I will link it in the chat uh, when we've done this presentation. I just want to thank you uh, so much for listening in today. And I'd also like to thank um, our partners in this project, um, as well as Fisheries and Oceans Canada through the SSFRS um, program. And uh, if you have any questions, um, I'm happy to take them uh, right now. Um, and if not, uh, you can feel free to email me at leah.colton at dell.ca um, or Ariel Smith um, at ariel at coastalaction.org. Thank you so much. Thank you, Leah. That was a really great presentation and I think really highlights the magnitude of the issue of, of ghost gear and the impacts that can have. Um, small story, my best friend's honeymoon was derailed by a crab chap fouling the propeller of a BC Ferries vessel and she couldn't go to Haida Gwaii. So oh, it's, no. it's a real um, problem. Um, does anybody have any questions for Leah before we move on to our uh, next segment? Um, 
And I think it was particularly interesting to see the different patterns of, of movement as ships or the vessels were looking for uh, lost gear and uh, retrieving lost gear. And I think AIS is really, really great to show the, the differences in movement there. And my hat off to you for being able to identify a lobster trap at the bottom of the ocean from, from that image that I think is an acquired skill for sure. Right. And if you have any questions for Leia, please feel free to um, you can drop them in the chat or put up your hand. And I will also note that if you are somebody who uses Twitter, um, we have um, some tweets happening on uh, at Clear Seas Org. If you want to share or retweet any of those, um, we, we encourage that sort of thing so that people can find out about the exciting work that people are doing with AIS and uh, maybe encourage them to, to sign up for future webinars. All right, so it looks like Leah may have answered all of the questions in her presentation that people may have had, but um, if, uh, if there are any more that come up, please put them in the chat or um, you can contact Leah directly later. So I think we'll, we'll go to our break now. We're gonna have a short 10 minute break. Um, feel free to have a stretch and get some water and then we'll come back to hear um, the work that Mark Stoddard has been doing in the Arctic. So we will reconvene at um, 20 minutes past the hour. Thank you all so much. And I'd now like to move into our last presentation for today's session. We're going to be hearing from Mark Stoddard about the work that he's been doing uh, related to example use cases of historical satellite AIS data for the analysis of maritime activity in polar waters. So we'll be now moving from the Atlantic to the Arctic region and hearing more about um, some of the challenges in that area. So Mark has a, a range of different research interests, including Arctic maritime remoteness, Arctic navigation, maritime risk assessment and operations research. And he's currently focused on extending existing land-based measures for remoteness into the maritime domain and developing new measures to address the unique challenge of measuring maritime remoteness in the Canadian Arctic. Uh, Mark is currently working on his PhD at Dalhousie, and he is also a defense scientist working for Defense Research and Development Canada, DRDC. Since joining DRDC, his research has focused on Arctic maritime domain awareness, undersea surveillance, and acoustic intelligence operations. Mr. Stoddard is currently the leader of the Operational Analysis and System Integration Support, or OASIS, group at the DRDC Atlantic Research Center in Halifax, Nova Scotia. So Mark, please, uh, please go ahead. Okay, I'm, I'm assuming everyone can hear me. Can you confirm? Yes, loud and clear. Perfect. Perfect, okay, thank you so much. So today I'm wearing a, a purely a student hat, so no reference to DRDC except a few logos in my presentation, but uh, for the last little while, I've been a PhD student of Dr. Ron Pillow, who's on, on the line today, looking primarily at Arctic maritime risk assessment, most broadly, and um, Today, I'm going to talk a little bit about my PhD research, but try to emphasize just the work we've done with satellite AIS data uh, to look at how, it's, how we use it in a variety of ways to support the analysis of maritime activity with emphasis in polar waters. Now, so yeah, a little bit in the background. My research is looking mostly at developing year-round measures of maritime remoteness and accessibility for coastal communities in the Canadian Arctic, with, with most of an emphasis on accessibility. Obviously, everyone recognizes that uh, going to areas of the Arctic in the middle of winter is far more difficult or challenging than going there in, in the summer due to the presence of harsher ice conditions in the winter months. So some of these communities become far more remote when you look at transportation time uh, to get there by certain classes of ships based on the time of year. And so what we're trying to understand is by using these, these um, better knowledge of the sea ice conditions and the capabilities of ships, we can look start to look at how long it could take to get to um, communities like Iqaluit, Pond Inlet throughout the year and try to use this to, to better understand um, remoteness and accessibility within that region. So currently there's a gap uh, in tools for that, but I'm not really gonna focus on those discussions. Most of today is about the quantitative methods that, that we're developing uh, to support this research. Uh, two main methods, one's focused on 
navigational risk assessment. So looking at how we incorporate ice into uh, risk assessment for ships transiting in the north and transit time estimation. So these are the techniques we use to um, use this knowledge of the ice and the capabilities of the ships to operate in ice and how that can then impact uh, transit time in the north. And AIS data, uh, its primary use within, within the PhD and within this work is to help us better understand polar vessel speeds within different ice regimes and how those relate to the various risk levels, um, which I'll speak to a little bit later. So AIS, I guess we've already talked about it, being the third presentation of the day is a bit good because I don't have to go over what AIS is. Um, obviously, it's a, a system that's been around since well, 2004 and before uh, to share information, position and identification inf information among ships with coastal authorities and more increasingly more with academic researchers uh, to support a variety of different studies. Its use is mandated on most large ships. And the early days, it was mostly terrestrial AIS networks, uh, you know, networks of shore based receivers that would uh, pick up ships as they got closer to ports and harbors. We're now with uh, satellite AIS and the rapid commercialization of, of satellite based AIS reception. It's used for global vessel tracking for a bunch of private government academic uh, initiatives and supports a lot of different research into maritime transportation. So the AIS data set that I'm working with was provided by the Dalhousie University Institute for Big Data Analytics. Um, Casey Hilliard, if, if many of you know him, he, he's been kind of assisting me or was assisting me. I think he's left Dalhousie now to uh, move to private industry, but he helped me pull out a, a subset of the AIS data that they had. It, it uh, covered 2018 and 2019. It was mostly a polar data set, so mostly interested in 60 degrees north to the pole, circumpolar, and it rounded out to about 20 million messages, individual messages uh, in our area of interest. And it, a lot of my work, because I'm looking at Arctic navigation and I'm looking, um, trying to understand vessel speeds, well, a lot of, a lot of that I want is I want good data. You know, not all ships are doing um, safe operations or that are, you know, some of them are just doing different, different types of activities. So I really wanted to focus on experienced polar ship operating fleets. So the, the four companies I'm mostly focused on are FedNav, Degagne, Coastal Shipping Limited, and NIAS. So they do a lot of the community resupply runs in the north. They service a lot of the iron mines and diamond mines up on Baffin Island. You know, and they're the, the fleets that I would expect to be mostly, you know, trying to go from A to B as expeditiously as possible, but also have a lot of experience. So the, you know, the vessel speed observations of those ships carry a bit more weight with me because I know they're not doing anything funny in between or during their transit. You know, if I incorporated uh, Coast Guard ships or survey ships, well, they'd be doing, you know, they'd be slowing down in different areas, not because of the ice conditions, but maybe because they're doing survey operations. So I really wanted an easy way to get rid of those anomalies from my data set. So I focus on ships that are primarily, you know, going from A to B as expeditiously as possible. Um, and we pulled these, all these vessels out for the 2018, 2019 timeframe. Right, so getting into one of the two things I'm gonna talk about today is uh, because I'm looking at Arctic transportation in the North, it's a pretty big challenge to include maritime transportation and quantitative studies, mainly because navigation is relatively unconstrained. Obviously, ships have a lot of freedom to maneuver. Um, so one of the big things we worked on uh, with, with some folks at the Coast Guard and within the Navy is to develop a transportation a network, essentially connecting the various communities we were most interested in in the Eastern Arctic. And we call this the Trusted Routes Graph. So this graph was actually derived from routes that were produced by the Coast Guard and, and Navy navigators, and then joined together into a network. The challenge we ran into, which we didn't really anticipate in the beginning, was tr trying to find ways to represent the actual communities. Obviously, if you try to get a community, like the location for Baker Lake or Rankin Inlet, you can go on Wikipedia and get a, a Latin long, but usually that Latin long is the city center on the shore. And then when you try to figure out, well, how do I represent that node within the maritime domain? Obviously, that would, and I would imply safe, safe water near that where a ship could anchor. 
because not all these communities have shoreside infrastructure where a ship could pull up alongside. We had this problem of trying to figure out where we wanted to uh, represent the communities that was in in the maritime domain, in the water, um, but where we knew ships would be able to get to. Because we're, because we're developing quantitative methods, it's really important for me to have feasible paths into the community. So I couldn't just arbitrarily uh, have the, uh, the network terminate at the coast or at the, the dock side. So we used AIS data to actually try and determine where were ships in and around those communities, where would they actually anchor? So the way this looks like is uh, we would take the AIS messages in and around communities uh filter it for when they had a, either they were you know uh, broadcasting a navigation status that they're anchored or that they had a vessel speed reported at zero so we get all these messages and then we apply some basic clustering algorithms to determine a point that can best represent the uh, the cluster of positions and these points are what we use as our node rep our maritime node representations for those communities in our transportation graph uh, so the figure on the left, the blue, the blue, uh, well, they're crosses, but you can hardly see that they're crosses, are all the individual AIS messages, the one, two, three messages. And the, the red star on the left side is, is the center point of the cluster or what the results of the clustering. And when we show it on the, the image on the right, just to kind of show you what I mean, when, yes, there's a, a short side dock, but it's really only suitable for small vessels but most of the vessels doing the community resupply are quite large and they usually anchor offshore and either barge in their fuel or in this case use umbilicals to land fuel so that was the whole goal of this clustering is to try and figure out where do the ships actually stop when they go to these communities and that's what represents the um the node that we use to represent those communities in in the water so we applied a similar approach to all the different communities in the Arctic we were interested in. Uh, in this case, Cambridge Bay, uh, Ugluluk, Ugluluk, uh Pond Inlet, another one, just to kind of show you these, these, these communities aren't very well developed and the shoreside infrastructure is very lacking and the ships very rarely come very close to shore. So in this case, the AI, AIS data provided a very useful data set to um, try to you know, as accurately as we can represent the uh, the locations where ships actually expect to be their destination in and around these communities. So that's it for that one use of AIS, which is how to determine where ships actually uh, stop or what is the destination in the Arctic for some of these communities that don't really have uh, docks alongside. The next one's sort of gonna start to bring in the main focus of my PhD work is on ice risk assessment and its impact on ship operations in the north. So in this case, we, we rely on an industry tool called Polaris, the Polar Operational Limits Assessment Risk Indexing System, a bit of a mouthful. Uh, and what it is, it's, it's a framework that allows ships and ship operators to assess the uh, safe operational limits for a particular polar class ship in the ice. Uh, its use is recommended as part of the International Maritime Organization's Polar Code. So it's used throughout, uh, throughout the world, um, including within the, the Canadian, uh, Canadian Arctic. And the output is what we call a risk index outcome, which will be important in some later slides. But the way it works, it's, very, it's a very simple practical system uh, where you uh, assess an ice regime. You have some knowledge of your ship's polar, polar class and its capabilities in the various ice regimes. And then there's risk values that are associated with each of the ice regimes. And you end up doing a simple little, you know, some addition, a little bit of math, very simple math. Uh, they, they do it on the bridge of the ships uh, to determine kind of a, traditionally it was a go, no go style decision, but now it's more of a go, no go or proceed at risk or proceed at caution type of output. And, and this is what we use to kind of uh, determine how ships, how we expect ships to operate in varying ice conditions. So what we do is we use a lot of historical ice information provided by the Canadian Ice Service. In this, in this animation, which is a bit dated now, uh, we used ice data from 2007 to 20, 2014. And the Canadian Ice Service produced weekly sea ice charts for the Canadian Arctic. And we're able to use historical sea ice data and use the, the Polaris Ice Risk Assessment to start to look at how how the risk changes throughout the year, depending on the week 
that a ship may be in a certain specific area in, in the north. And the, this is kind of what we use to look at community accessibility. So as, as the, the ice melts and the waters open up, communities become much more accessible, especially when measured in uh, the time it takes to get there from different locations. Back to how we use AIS. So as I mentioned, one of the big things we're interested in is transit time estimation. Well, luckily with AIS, in this case, we have a ship that's leaving uh, Gascoigne Inlet, which is a small little inlet on Devon Island heading down to Cambridge Bay. Using satellite AIS data, I can see its track. That track tells me the route that it executed and how long it took to get from the, uh, the start point to the end point. And what we do is we look at traditional ETAs, which are normally computed you know, as a speed times distance. And, and normally a ship likes to operate at its max economic speed. Well, in the Arctic, that's kind of not really a feasible way to generate a good estimate. So typically they use a conservative estimate of say eight knots. We expect to average eight knots over this transit and, um, and then they can get an estimate of how long it's gonna take them. What they traditionally have never really considered is how their route intersects with the ice, the current ice conditions. So in this case, we're showing a route that was executed in, on August 30th and we're showing a sea ice chart that corresponds to the exact same time. And what we've done is used our ice risk assessment to determine what the, the operational constraints might be on that ship or the risks. And then now we're gonna to try to incorporate these risks into our transit time calculation. The idea being, if you're in green, that means it's completely unrestricted safe operations. You can probably go faster. And obviously as you go into increasing levels of ice risk, whether that's the, the yellow, the orange or the red category, we try to adjust the speeds to account for the uh, increased ice risk that's present. So what you end up getting is a route that, that was executed and we look at how it intersects with the, the ice risk. And then we apply speed, speed corrections. So in green, I think I was using for this case 12 knots. In uh, yellow, it was eight knots. In orange, it was five knots. And in red, it was three knots. And we from this, we start to produce what we call ice risk adjusted estimated transit times. So in this case, if you used a traditional ETA, assuming I'm gonna average eight knots for the entire duration and the distance is 523 nautical miles, it would take you about 65 hours. Uh, for the ice risk adjusted ETA, we end up getting a 93.6 hours. Using the AIS message that corresponds to when they left Gascoigne Inlet to when they arrived at Cambridge Bay, it worked out to about 107 hours. So we see that adjusting for there is obviously a need to adjust for the ice risks along the route. And the facts that we have, we have this information, the Canadian Ice Service provides it. Uh, what, what's lacking is the quantitative methods to make it easy to do these calculations for the ships. Uh, and that's kind of where we're very interested is to develop robust, reliable um, quantitative methods to, to improve the incorporation of ice risk into transit time estimation in the Arctic. So to conclude, uh, moving quickly along here, um, AIS data is, continues to play an important role for the development and mainly the testing of the quantitative methods we're developing for, for my PhD and, and for this, this region. So we're, we're trying to improve, you know, what are the ship speeds adjustments we should be using for the various risk categories and trying to use AIS data to, like, for quality assurance. Uh, so we pick routes that we know were executed by, by trusted ship operators that have experience and, and how long it takes them to, to navigate that. And, and then we try to tune and test our methods to ensure that we're getting uh, reliable results that are you know, applicable throughout the Arctic. Uh, the clustering of historical AIS data in and around communities kind of can tell you a lot about anchorage locations, um, all these things that could feed into potentially uh, coastal risk management you know, discussions or research in and around these communities or ensuring that anchorage is, anchoring is happening, happening in safe regions or maybe less environmentally sensitive regions. Uh, it could be used for many different things. And then the use of historical AIS data to characterize uh, polar class ship speeds and varying ice regimes is, is a very useful application of AIS data. You know, there's not a lot of ships operating in the north. There's not a lot of... Um, known knowns when it comes to ship speeds and varying ice regimes because it is very complex to associate 
the local ice conditions with you know AIS message reports it takes a lot, a lot of knowledge of the ice it takes a lot of data um, and kind of that's where we're really focused on is 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 um, for every AIS report in the Arctic trying to associate that with the, the best ice uh, assessments of the ice conditions at the time that that AIS message was reported and then keeping track of the, the, the vessel speeds that we've observed so we can start to produce statistical character characterizations of um, vessel speeds in different ice regimes um, to feed all kinds of different quantitative analysis. And I think that's, that's it. Obviously, this is not really a project that's run to completion. This is just a kind of a snapshot of some of the work we're doing uh, and still writing up and still researching at Dalhousie and uh, our uh, our group in the industrial engineering department. And um, that's it, over. Thank you so much, Mark. That was uh, a really fascinating snapshot into the work that you're doing. And I can see a lot of implications for better, better knowledge, better data for navigation in the Arctic to be safer and have um, you know, more information about what the ice is doing and the implications that it has on a transit. So I think this will be really interesting to see how this um, continues to evolve. And uh, I was wondering, I'll start off the questions with, do you, uh, have you incorporated any of the data that you've got of where ships are operating near communities into the low impact corridors uh, work that's been ongoing for the last few years? No. <laughs> I think no, I've, I've had no, yeah, no involvement or awareness of that activity. Okay, yeah, I think that could be a, a really interesting um, to add to the uh, understanding of what ships are doing in their communities and especially as we're starting to see some investment in infrastructure in arctic communities that knowing where ships are are currently operating and how they're operating would be really useful to create more informed uh, decisions if anybody has uh, questions for Mark, please feel free to put your hand up and ask a question, or you can put it in the chat and I can read it out for you. Um, I, I note that uh, Mark, your, your supervisor, Ron Polo, is, is here with us as well. And Ron is the uh, one of the co-leads of the Canadian Marine Shipping Risk Forum along with, with myself. So we have uh, representation from uh, Dalhousie as, as well today more representation from Dalhousie. We also had Leia here too. Uh, so I've got a question here from uh, JD Leahy from Washington Ecology. And are ships currently using any rules of thumb for estimating these times or, speed or speeds? Oh. Yes and no, I'm sure they are. They, we have talked a lot with FedNav. They've been probably the most open about how they plan and conduct their operations. The reality is they, they, they say they don't do a lot of operational planning. They don't bother, I guess. Is, you know, they get there when they get there. You know, they, they believe that Arctic navigation is more you know, something that happens at the tactical level. They may, they may say we're going to try and get there in five days, um, but they don't try to get down to the level of, you know, our decimal hours <laughs> kind of thing that we're trying to do here so they 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 have rules of thumb they know different times a year how long it would take for them to get to the ports that they usually go to but that's more based on experience i don't think they try to adjust those transit times based on tactical ice analysis or anything at least not that they shared over Thanks, Mark. Uh, so there's a question from Nadia uh, Menard, who's asking about the low impact corridors initiative that I just mentioned. So I'll just read out um, that it is the low impact shipping corridors is a government of Canada led initiative with the goal of developing low impact marine transportation corridors in the Arctic Ocean to encourage marine shipping and transportation traffic to use routes that pose less risk and minimize the impacts on communities and the environment. And um, Clear Seas has been involved in some of the research by supporting um, work out of the University of Ottawa with the uh, lead researcher, uh, Dr. Jackie Dawson. And we've got some um, uh, information on our website, clearseas.org, uh, about that project. And I will also put a link to an article into the chat that explains um, some of the, the work that's been done there. So I will just share that and you can, um, 
and take a look at the uh, description of the work that was done to um, understand the impacts of shipping activity on communities and the environment in the Arctic and start to, start to identify ways to mitigate those, those impacts through working with communities to understand the impacts of ice breaking on migration routes and um, ship noise on marine mammals and the impact that that has for subsistence harvesting and uh, many, many other impacts of that nature. Are there any other questions for, for Mark or also if you had questions for Norma or Andrea? Unfortunately, Leah's had to go, but if people do have questions about Leah's presentation on uh, ghost ghost vessels, or not ghost vessels, ghost uh, fishing equipment, um, I'd be happy to relay those questions to her and she can get in touch with you directly. So any, any and all questions, um, or if anybody has their, their own research that they'd like to, to briefly share, we still have a few minutes before we need to wrap up today. And Norma, I wanted to ask you a question about um, other possible implications for using the um, B plus type AIS transponder. Do you see that as something that would be um, useful for fishing vessels to help with uh, understanding their activities and, and safety? Uh, I know that um, safety for small vessels is, is an area of concern. Yeah, I think it's a technology that it will be useful for for vessels that are not maybe required to carry AIS. Um, I, and vessels that are operating in areas with poor coverage of terrestrial AIS, even, even in our study on the west coast of Vancouver Island, um, there are a couple of receivers from Coast Guard that the coverage is pretty good, but when you start getting into uh, the islands and around some of the more narrow passages and whatnot, uh, we noticed that uh, there were some spots where it was a bit weak, the signal, or there was no signal. So if you you have then the supplement, you can have satellite air as a data to supplement that, that's great. But it, it, it only really seems to work if the transponders are B plus. With B alone, it was not working very well. So, if you're a small vessel and you work in sort of remote areas where the terrestrial is not very good, um, then the V plus is really the way to go if you want that that coverage. Yeah, um, that's that's great to know because yeah, if you you think you're going to be safe by installing a, a B transponder and then you go outside the reach of terrestrial and you're you're not getting any signals. So exactly. Good. Yeah. Uh, good to know. And you said it was a little bit more expensive to have the B plus, but I think so. But it's it's I think it's made to hundred three hundred dollars more expensive, but not, yeah, not wildly so. Not it's as not much more as an than a class. A, it's not more than a thousand dollars like they are for the A class. Um, I think that that's great. Maybe we'll see more uh, coverage for for smaller vessels and have a better better picture of what all of the different types of marine traffic are doing. I think that's going to be really interesting. Um, Mark, I wanted to ask you about um, with with your presentation. When do you anticipate being able to um, to, to wrap up the research that you're doing? What's your what's your timeline? And uh, is the goal to be able to share this, um, this sort of transit time forecasting with, with ship operators so that they can make better estimates for how long it's gonna take them to get through a certain area based on the, the ICE uh, data that's, that's known? Did, did Ron put you up to that question? <laughs> No, I am, in, I am in my ninth year almost of my PhD. But who's counting? Who's <laughs> yeah, that's counting? right. Faculty of Graduate Studies is. <laughs> um, you know, everything has to be done, I think, within the next year. Uh, I think the way we're going to release it is just, to, you know, there'll be a couple of, you know, journal papers on sort of the methods we've we've developed. The, the ice risk assessment works pretty, 
pretty widely published already, but you know, we're not the only ones looking at applying uh, some of these techniques to, to better understand navigational risks. Um, the calculations of the, you know, the ice risk adjusted transit times, it, that's kind of where I think the, the more interesting work lies and it requires a lot more analysis. Again, this, this AIS analysis is kind of critical to get those speed. It's only as good as the speed estimates you're using. So you, you can be great at de calculating or determining the risks, but unless you know how those risks translate into slower ship speeds, um, you're really just kind of guessing. And um, that's where I'm trying to be as careful as I possibly can and trying to use the best data that I possibly can and focusing on the best ships that I think are the, the safest ones so that the observations represent kind of uh, the highest quality uh, result. But yeah, it'll just be published in, you know, in the literature, I guess. And there, I'm not envisioning a, 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 a tool or a widget or you know, and you know, some piece of software. It's really just kind of here is the method, the quantity, you know, the method how you um, how you produce them, the algorithms that you would use to to produce these, and then some some assessments of the quality of the estimates. Um, but yeah, I'm not not envisioning a tool, or I didn't get the memo either. I didn't. I don't have a story map, but I'm a QGIS user too, so I don't. They don't really have such good tools like ArcGIS does, but but um, yeah. yeah. No, story maps they're all the rage i know i miss i'm missing it i remember that was i do i have been exposed to them before never never resonated with me though but they were great mm -hmm. i can see the. i can see the power of using those those tools to communicate oh. geospatial data for your for your dissertation that's right story map yeah that's right that's my recommendation <laughs> Uh, yeah. Well, I'm not seeing any other questions, so I think we'll just we'll wrap it up here. And uh, if any questions do come up after the fact, feel free to reach out to to me. Um, I my email address is um, megan.matheson at clearseas.org, and you can find me on the Clearseas website uh, or any of our presenters today. We will be sending out the recording and the presentation slides, uh, or rather, a link to them. Um, to all of the people who've registered. So if you had to miss any aspect of this, you can catch up later. And I wanna thank everyone so much for participating today. It's been um, great to, to learn about this new research. We will be having an additional, uh, our next AIS webinar segment will be coming up in the early fall. And that will be focused on, um, we're going to be looking into the EMSA program, the Enhanced Marine Situational Awareness program that the Government of Canada has put uh, in place with a number of different Indigenous communities around Canada. And um, we will hopefully be hearing from a community or one or two communities of how they have been using AIS data to increase their understanding. So, thank you so much for joining us today and have a great rest of your day. <laughs>